How can you avoid being misled by unhealthy YouTubers, pastors, and Christian leaders? Here are seven things to watch out for. Number one, they blame their audience for not having the things that they want. Have you ever been watching a sermon and then out of nowhere, the pastor pauses and pretty much just chastises the congregation for not clapping enough? I've personally heard pastors say things like this when they're preaching. I know I'm preaching better than you're responding, and then the congregation cheers and claps out of guilt. I need to start preaching to the other campus more. You're all dead out there. Look at all the empty seats out there. You all need to start inviting more people. And then of course there's the common jokes about the people not having enough coffee this morning. Now, there's nothing wrong with a pastor encouraging their congregation to clap and to participate in the sermon so that the pastor knows everyone's tracking and to create a good, warm environment. There's nothing wrong with a YouTuber asking people to like and subscribe or a Christian organization, a leader of that organization to ask the employees or the donors or the volunteers to do something extra so that they can accomplish a goal that they have but it's unhealthy when they start chastising and blaming the audience or the other people for the things that they feel like this ministry should be accomplishing. Instead of getting mad at other people for not getting what they want, what's much wiser and healthier is for that person to prayerfully consider making wise goals and then figuring out wise ways on how to accomplish those goals instead of blaming others because that's really a form of entitlement. As Jesus said in Mark 10 verse 45, for even the son of man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Number two, they use other people's tragedies for their own personal gain. Now, I certainly believe that there is a time and place to call out false prophets, to address a certain issue that you feel like is happening in your space. If you're a YouTuber or you're in a certain organization and you feel like there's a problem and it somehow relates to you, I think it's good at times to address this openly and let people know about a warning you feel that they should know about this other certain person or other idea. Paul, for example, certainly did name names at times when there was an issue he felt like needed to be addressed. And likewise, it's not always wrong to talk about other people's tragedies. There's examples in scripture where Paul talked about other people's sicknesses, other people's issues, as a way of encouraging other Christians and to point to the faithfulness of God. But this certainly can be a slippery slope. Calling out other people that you disagree with or publicly arguing can quickly morph into unbiblical arguing that is unfit for the Lord's servant and gossip. So again, we really just need discernment to make sure that this is being done in a healthy way. So as you are listening to YouTubers, podcasters, pastors who are talking about other people's issues, make sure you're just asking the Holy Spirit for discernment to make sure you're not getting involved in something that's unhealthy. Look for someone who's seeking to obey the advice in Ephesians 4. Verse 29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Number three, they focus on the process that their accusers take rather than just openly addressing the accusations that their accusers, accusers are making. So whenever a church scandal breaks out, sadly, the pattern is usually pretty predictable if that pastor is unhealthy. Instead of just addressing the actual issues, they draw attention away from themselves, away from the accusations, and they start pointing the finger at the accusers for the process that those accusers took when they called out this pastor's issues. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen Matthew 18 verses 15 through 20 used in an improper way, especially when it comes to churches addressing their pastor's issues. The pastor who gets accused says, well, these people didn't come to me directly like Matthew, 5, Matthew 18 says to do. Therefore, these people cannot be trusted. They are wrong. I am right. First off, when you actually read that passage in Matthew 18, it's very clear right in verse 15, it's talking about personal sins between individual 
brothers in Christ or sisters in Christ. It's an individual process when there's individual sins. It says, if your brother sins against you. So I have a whole article and video on how this passage is commonly misused when issues occur in the church. So if my pastor personally offends me, personally sins against me, yes, I should practice Matthew 18 and go directly to that person. However, when I discover a pastor committing adultery, stealing from the church, abusing other members that aren't me, that is not a personal sin against me. That is a corporate sin against many other people. And therefore, Matthew 18 is not the most relevant passage in scripture to address that issue. Actually, 1 Timothy 5, 19 through 20 is a much better passage to address that type of issue in that context. It states, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses but those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. False accusations should not be allowed to ruin an innocent person's character and reputation. Thus, we should be really careful to verify the truthfulness of the accusations. But Christians also need to be careful they're not showing partiality to their favorite pastor or Christian leader by refusing to investigate accusations against an elder that need to be investigated. The church is commanded to publicly rebuke a pastor who is abusing his pastoral role. Now, when someone just accuses you of something out of the blue, you're not required to address that random accusation. But in the context of that passage, where we're talking about a church that you have signed up to submit to their authority and vice versa, they have said, yes, we are leading you and you are to keep us accountable, then that process in 1 Timothy 5 should be followed and we should not be playing partiality and having favoritism and just taking one person's word for it because, hey, they're the pastor, and these people's word, oh, they're just regular congregants, even though there's multiple accusations. The fact is, when someone is accused of something rightfully, like this passage tells us to do, that person being accused is going to do one of two things. They're either going to start accusing the other people and throwing mud at them or complaining about the process. Hey, you didn't do this right. Therefore, hey, it's like, the court didn't follow the right process, so even though I'm guilty, I'm actually innocent. That's not what they're gonna do if they're healthy. If they're healthy, they're just gonna say, here's the evidence for why you're wrong. Number four, they attack their accuser's character, again, rather than just logically answering the accusations being made. Either you stole money or you didn't. Either you plagiarized or you didn't. You either misused your authority or you didn't. Just address the issue. You don't need to attack other people who you feel like are attacking you, even though they're just presenting the evidence that's been presented to them. We on the outside who are following these types of people need to look at how they're responding to the accusations. Are they slinging mud and attacking the character of those people who are making these accusations rather than just logically addressing the accusations? That'd be a lot simpler just to say, this is why that person's not accurate in their accusation. As Proverbs 9, 7 states, Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. It's fine if they don't agree with the correction. No one should accept false accusations if they don't agree with them. Everyone should have the right to defend themselves. But if someone in power is trying to injure those who are correcting them, this is a sign of an unhealthy leader. Number five. If they never talk about sin and they always talk about blessings. It's not wrong for Christian content creators to talk about topical questions rather than expositionally preaching. We should not hold a YouTube channel or a podcast or even someone writing a book to the same biblical standard that we should hold a church to in teaching the whole counsel of God because a YouTube channel and a podcast and an author are not pastors. They are not supposed to be replacing the church. A church, in my view, should be expositionally preaching in most of their sermons because they're called to teach their congregation the whole counsel of God. So it's not wrong for a parachurch ministry to assist the church by diving into a unique niche that sometimes is difficult to do in a sermon. For example, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I like to focus on relationship advice for Christian single people. 
People seem to enjoy and are helped by that, and that's a topic I'm passionate about and have learned a lot about. Dave Ramsey, for example, has chosen to really narrow in on finances. There are tons of pastors who expositionally preach on Sunday, and then in their personal ministries, they write individual books about individual topics. So that's certainly not wrong to do, and I, that's a good thing to do. However, what's wrong when a Christian YouTuber, podcaster, or even a pastor who's actually supposed to be preaching right through the entire word of God, what's wrong is when they never talk about sin. You don't have to talk about every topic under the sun. You don't have to expositionally preach to be someone who's doing something good for the kingdom of God. But if you're trying to teach biblical topics and ideas and you never talk about sin, you're being inauthentic because it's everywhere in scripture and it's a, the common issue. It's the issue that people are struggling with. That's the problem that God came to solve. Separation from God because of sin is solved through Jesus Christ. And if we never talk about the bad news, it's impossible as for, for us to be accurately presenting the good news. Sometimes I'll be listening to someone who's really gifted at speaking and you're like, what? Something's missing. This is a really great sermon. And then you watch another sermon. And you're like, that was really good too. You kind of feel like motivated and they're saying good things. But you're like, something feels off about this. And what that often is, it's not about what this person is saying. It's about what they're never saying. They're never pointing out sin. And they're only talking about blessings. And that is a hallmark trait of someone who follows the prosperity gospel. They don't ever talk about your issues. They don't ever talk about the problems. And they only talk about the blessings and the promises. And you feel really good afterwards, but it's misleading because we all are sinners. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. And we need that free gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's what we really need to hear most of all. And even in these subcategories of finances and relationships and other things, Sin is a problem and therefore we need the solution in Jesus Christ. And we need advice on how to apply that specifically to that context. Number six, they talk about future claims a lot and they focus on supernatural signs, making wild predictions to the audience that, that's watching them. Now, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I often use titles and thumbnails that say something like, five signs God is blank, or three things that will happen when God is blank, or when this happened, it means God is blank. Now, when you actually watch my videos or you've been watching this channel for a while, you know that I explain I'm not talking about supernatural signs and wonders where I'm proclaiming something over you or I'm prophesying something over you. Here is what God is going to do to your life I know what God's doing. That's not what I'm saying at all. Rather, what I'm pointing out are evidence for what God wants you to do. That's how I use the word signs, and there's different ways to use that, sign, that word. The prophetic supernatural signs certainly are biblical, but Jesus said not to search for those signs, not to ask for those signs. God's going to do that when God's going to do that. However, there's another example of signs in the Bible where we're talking about evidence for what God wants you to do. For example, if you're saying, does God want me to marry this person? And then you read 1 Corinthians 7, 39 that says, do not marry someone who's not in the Lord. And then you read 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be unequally yoked. Those are signs that God does not want you to marry that person because the evidence of their unbelief and lack of profession in Christ is a visible, knowable sign, evidence from God that he's saying, do not marry that person if you're a Christian because that goes against the word of God. Sadly, however, over the years, many people have taken the general structure of my titles and thumbnails and then they've applied this wrong type of signs. They're saying, five signs God is this. And then you watch the video and they're proclaiming everything over the viewers. And basically they're just using the same old tactics of a psychic. You come into the room and they say, I sense someone here is going to be receiving their spouse soon. I sense someone here is going to be getting a new job. And they're proclaiming and prophesying these things over you. That's not healthy. That's not biblical. You should really avoid people who are doing that. Be careful when people are using this word signs and pointing about the prophetic in an unbiblical way. Now to balance all that, 1 Thessalonians 
Thessalonians 5 does say in verse 19 and 22, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So yes, let's not be disrespectful to people who are saying they're prophesying. Let's not be disrespectful to people who are saying that. But do what this verse says. Use discernment. Assess what they're saying. Make sure it doesn't, is it unbiblical? And don't let them off the hook when they say something and it sounds good and then the opposite happens. Again, it's the old psychic trick. I sense you doing this, I sense you doing that. Not healthy. 1 Timothy 1, 6 through 7 explains, Certain persons by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. And number seven, they try to replace the one mediator between God and man, which is Jesus Christ. Now, God has certainly blessed his church with varying gifts meant to be used to serve Christians, serve the world for the glory of God. But when we start using our gifting to steal Jesus' glory and point to ourselves as the solution the audience needs, that is replacing Jesus Christ as the one mediator between God and man. That's one of my issues with some people who claim they have a deliverance ministry. I'm going to probably do a video on that at some point. I'm not condemning everyone who says they have a deliverance ministry. I think it really depends on what you mean and what you're actually doing. But one concern I have with watching that type of content is that they are often becoming the mediator. They are the solution to your issue, your oppression. You need them to deliver you. They have this gift. And to me, that replaces Jesus. That instead of pointing to Jesus and showing the biblical truth, hey, when the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. They start putting themselves in between you and God as the mediator. And that's super dangerous. As 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 7 states, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Just as Paul was appointed to point to Jesus, so too is every healthy Christian YouTuber, pastor, or leader. When anyone begins to point to themselves as the solution to your problem, this is a sign of an unhealthy person. Do you know how to identify a cult leader? Here's a video where I go over 13 weird signs and actions of cult leaders that expose them for what they really are. I'm Mark from ApplyGodsWord.com. Really hope this was helpful to you. And until next time, God bless.